Texas is in a new conference, having lost six of its eight leading scorers, but Rodney Terry's team is going to be all right, all right, all right. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Monday. Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are your co-hosts. I'm Andy Patton. That is Isaac Shade over there. You are joining us at the place to get your college basketball content Monday through Friday. 52 weeks out of the year. We are here for you every single day talking college hoops. You can also join us on our Discord channel. If you have not done so yet, it is free to join. There's a link in the show notes on audio and video platforms. We're talking college basketball there all the time. Also want to give a special shout out to our everyday listeners and those of you hanging out with us on the Discord. And a reminder to all of you that you can listen to this show ad-free on Amazon Music. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Isaac, four weeks, four weeks from today, we have college basketball back. One of the first teams playing on that November fourth game, or on November fourth, one of the first big games, I should say. Lots of teams playing that day, but one of the big games on that day is the Texas Longhorns. That is who we are talking about today. They're taking on Ohio State in the first game of the season. We're going to talk all about Texas. We're going to talk about their move to the SEC, how they did last year. We're going to talk about the fact that they lost the majority of their starting lineup from last year. Uh, They brought in a ton of fantastic transfers, a really highly regarded freshman. What does this all mean for Rodney Terry's team? And then we're going to close out the show taking a look at Texas's schedule, how we think they're going to do in the non-conference as well as the conference slate where they might get seated in their first year in the SEC. Let's start with last year. Isaac team went 21 and 13 in their final season as a member of the Big 12. They finished 9 and 9 in conference play. That was good for 7th place in the conference. They lost to Kansas State in the first round of the Big 12 tournament. Still earned a 7 seed. Again, Big 12 is one of those conferences where you can go 500 in league play and still end up getting a single digit seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, they beat Colorado State in just a hideous hideous basketball game. They won 56-44 was the final score in that one. Ended up losing to a now conference foe in Tennessee in the second round. The two-seeded Vols beat them 62-58. But Isaac, the big storyline is not as much what this team did last year because frankly, it's a pretty new look roster. But the main thing is this is a team that's moving into the SEC and we see it's working for them quite well on the football side of things as they are the number one team in the country uh, following a loss by Alabama to Vanderbilt. Uh, but we kind of want to talk about what this transition is going to look like for them on the basketball side of things. No. Is it going to go as smoothly as it has gone for them on the gridiron? Well, uh, Andy, unless they're going to be the number one team in the nation, no, it won't Probably be. Not. <laughs> that's not a shot at the basketball team. That's just like, by the way, media members, what are we doing? Why Alabama beats Georgia and you jump them over Texas last yeah. week? I mean, I nope. just, I do not understand why these people do things they do, but uh, alas. Um, yeah, Andy, I am really curious to see exactly how this goes because at one level, we look at this and say, oh man, what a relief. You're not in the Big 12 anymore, that gauntlet mm-hmm. and everything. But I mean, we've been talking about so much. The SEC is coming up yeah. and up and up. And this is a very difficult conference. And so I honestly, if I'm Rodney Terry and crew, I don't think there's much of any kind of uh, like breath of fresh air of like, mm-hmm. oh, this is easier for us. Um, but I think what helps in terms of the, the seamlessness of the transition is they've been playing a very difficult conference yeah. schedule in the Big 12, and they will continue to do so now albeit just against a whole crop of new schools other than Mizzou used to be in the Big 12 and Texas A&M used to be in the Big 12, so there's some familiar foes. And Oklahoma. And Oklahoma, obviously, who they're coming over with. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's quite a bit of familiarity there along with all the SEC programs that they'll be playing. And so, Andy, that's interesting. I think the uh, perhaps the funniest thing for me Mm -hmm. is I asked my wife right before we started recording anything I should tell the good people about Texas, and she said, uh, shock is not the coach there anymore. Right. And that's all we need to know about that. So, um, <laughs> and she, she goes, but, uh, there, wasn't there that other guy and he got in a little bit of trouble and he, did he get fired? Yeah. 
yeah. And now we're on to a third coach since all of that. So, uh, mm-hmm. Andy, I think that's probably the most important things we need to know about the Longhorns. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, they are playing that other coach. Uh, he is the coach. That's, of course, Chris Beard. He's the coach at Ole Miss. And the Texas Long or Beard was not able to escape Texas, moving over to the SEC. Texas follows him over there. They're going to play once this year. It's at Ole Miss. So Chris Beard have to face the vitriol that he will likely face in Austin, Texas. He also doesn't have to go back to Lubbock anytime soon, so he's going to avoid some of those uh, hostile crowds for the time being. But certainly uh, one of the other fun wrinkles of Texas being in the SEC now is those potential matchups against Ole Miss. We'll see how long Chris Beard stays at Ole Miss, but he's done a a very good job there up to this point. But, uh, yeah, I I think – the other thing that's tricky about projecting this is we can say, okay, the Big 12 and the SEC are maybe more comparable than, uh, you know, than not. I, I think they're, you know, if you go about 500 in the Big 12, does that mean you're going to go 500 in the SEC? And like, we're not going to really ever get an answer to that because this roster is just completely different. Like, it's it's not the same players, but it's the same coach. It's a few of the same players. But as you noted, uh, Isaac, only one player who started more than 10 games last year is back. They had set six players started at least 14 games. For Texas last year. Every single one of them is gone. Max A. Smith, gone. Tyrese Hunter, gone. Dylan Mitchell, gone. Dylan DeSue, gone. Ithiel Horton, gone. Brock Cunningham, gone. The only player back who started more than 10 games last year is Caden Shedrick. He started 11 games. He was dealing with some injury stuff. He's expected to be a key contributor for them this year, but that's a ton of production out the door for the Longhorns. Their top four scorers are gone. Six of their top eight leading scorers are gone. Like this is a team that's going to look dramatically different and they have a very good transfer portal class. We're going to get to that. We're going to talk about some of those guys coming in and a fantastic freshman Trey Johnson. But we're talking about a team that's going into a new conference that is just an entirely new roster of players. Like there's a a lot of of newness uh, for this team uh, heading into the, the upcoming season. And it's interesting, Andy, because we have several schools that are in that boat of a, a crud ton of new players, yeah. but typically it's because of coaching changes like mm-hmm. at Louisville or Arkansas or Kentucky, right? right? Where we expect it. Um, and it's just, it, it was just the way everything broke down with this Texas team. It's not like mm-hmm. anything was wrong or broken or jacked up. It's just the way it goes sometimes in the transfer portal. And I think we used to like, oh, what's wrong in Austin, Texas, or right. what's wrong in this place that lost a bunch of people, but it's just, It's the lay of the land, man. And this is just sometimes how it's going to be. And so, Andy, I think the key um, to that seamlessness, and I love that you brought together how seamless will this transition to the SEC be, Mm -hmm. uh, brought that alongside all this roster turnover because Rodney Terry's ability to bring this roster together and to gel is going to be the key for how Mm -hmm. seamless it is. So a great point. One of the good pieces of news for Texas in the non-conference portion of the schedule is they're going to have a very easy time in some of this non-conference schedule. Folks, For uh, just as a reminder, in the SEC, they're still playing 18 games, meaning that all the SEC schools can play 13 non-conference games. Of Texas's 13 non-con games, eight are what we would call buy games, just, you know, games where you pay teams to come play you. And Andy, we started looking at it. And at least per Torvix preseason rankings, mm-hmm. of those eight by games, seven of them are against teams projected 332nd or worse. <laughs> Houston Christian, 354. Chicago State, 332. Mississippi Valley State, 363. Literally the worst team in the nation. Mm-hmm. Delaware State, 333. Uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff, 361. New Orleans, 336. Nor- Northwestern State, 349. The only of those buy games that's not in the 300s is New Mexico State at 179. Good grief. If you can't figure out how to gel your team against that, man, I don't know what we're doing in Austin, Texas, but uh, we need to we need to make sure Texas gets some comeuppance for this puff pastry schedule. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because it's I think it works for a team in this situation. Like I get why they would do it. It's obviously it's it's pretty extreme in in how uh, how unbalanced it is because they have UConn in the non conference. They have Ohio State, uh, some very they have NC State, some good teams, and then just some very 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 uh, not good teams. Or at least teams projected to not be good at all this year. But for a team with as much roster lack of continuity as Terry's team has, you you kind of need those games to beef it up. At least they're starting with Ohio State, a, a much bigger test to kick off the season. We'll see how it kind of goes. After that, but yeah, this is a, a a schedule that's going to allow them to experiment with some lineups and, and and kind of play some guys maybe at different positions just to see what works because I think there's a lot of questions about how this lineup is going to work, how this 
uh, starting lineup, the the projections that or the um, rotation, things like that. There's a lot of question marks, and I think that Terry's got a lot of games on the schedule to help figure that out, uh, for better or worse. Which is important because another thing I think, Andy, that we're both feeling is that there haven't been any just plain bad years for Rodney Terry. Mm -hmm. But I do think that because of the circumstances in which he was hired, where a lot of people were like, ah, we're, we're still going to go, even though his interim coaching year went really well, yeah. there was still this prevailing thought that Texas would look elsewhere for a head coach. He proved himself well enough. Uh, you know, Texas made the elite eight, should have made it the final four choked and Miami got in instead. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think we both feel that this is a critical year for his tenure in Austin. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to watch that uh, with keen eyes. I, and I think the, the conference shift is a big part of that, Andy, if we're being honest, because, yeah. because of the SEC money, because of the need mm -hmm. to compete with the rest of the SEC and the Big Ten, I think he will be under a microscope despite not having any, any uh, just plain out bad years. So we'll have all eyes on that and update it throughout the season. Now, Andy. The Longhorns may have lost most of last year's production, as we talked about, but they have a very strong transfer portal class coming in that should keep Coach Terry's team afloat in the SEC. We're going to discuss that and so much more coming up in just a second. Right after we tell you about LinkedIn, when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find the quality professionals who are right for your role. And that's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And LinkedIn isn't just some job board. They help you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else. And even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but who might just be open to that perfect role that you've got for them. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit the other leading job sites. So folks, if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking at the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. So come on, man, hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. And they know that small businesses, you know, you're wearing a bunch of different hats, trying to keep all the plates spinning, and you really might not have the time or resources to hire efficiently or effectively. Well, thankfully, LinkedIn is always trying to find ways to help you in that endeavor. For example, they recently launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions to just make it a quicker thing for you. So come on, man, post your job for free right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, it's time now to try to take shape of what Texas's roster is after all the loss that we had talked about coming off of last season. We mentioned they do have Caden Shedrick back. They do have Kendall Weaver back and also Zarek Onyema and Devin Pryor. Andy, it's not much, but uh, where we really turn our attention to is the additions, particularly through the transfer portal, and an absolute dude coming out of high school. Let's start with the portal. Arthur Kaluma coming over from Kansas State. He's been around the block a couple of different places now, but is a really uh, just good, solid player. I don't think he's anybody that's going to jump off and be like, man, that's our superstar. Right. But he's somebody that's just so reliable and I think will be really helpful for Rodney Terry and his team. Tremont Mark comes over from Arkansas. He had some really, really big time games in Fayetteville last year. And I think he will be a helpful backcourt cog along with Jordan Pope, who didn't want to stay at Oregon State and go down to the non uh, power conference level with all due respect to the West coast conference. Um, but he, along with Mark, man, I think that's going to be a potent backcourt lineup. Mm -hmm. Jason Kent and Julian Larry both come in from the Sycamores of Indiana state. Obviously coach shirts leaves to go to St. Louis. And so mm -hmm. these guys peace out and along with Malik Presley coming from Vanderbilt, whose coach also, mm -hmm. uh, left, uh, less of his own design, I would say in Cherry Stackhouse. And then, Andy, we, we got a couple of freshmen, but the big name to know, with all due, due respect to Nicholas Cody and Jamie Vincent, is Trey Johnson, who is a five-star shooting guard, can probably switch up to small forward depending on what these lineups are going to look like, but a you know kind of consensus top 10-ish guy, but kind of closer to five than 10, and I think is going to make a really, really big impact in Austin this year, and is going to be a lot of fun to, to watch. I think part of it is that he does get these veterans coming in in Mark and Pope, even though you've got, you know, the Tyrese Hunters and the Max Acemuses of the world out, you do have these veteran backcourt guys to kind of help ease him in 
to college. Andy, what, what do you make of all this? Yeah, it, it was a wild off season in the sense that there was just so much roster turnover, but a lot of it was expected. I mean, I, I think sure. we, we saw a few guys hit the transfer portal that maybe we weren't necessarily expecting to lose or to, to, to leave, but I don't think anybody's stunned that Dylan Mitchell left. I think a lot of people thought he was going to go to the NBA, but he ultimately decided to hit the transfer portal. He goes to Cincinnati. Uh, Tyrese Hunter was Again, somebody that maybe I'm sure Terry wanted to keep around, but he ends up going to Memphis. Most of the other guys were out of eligibility. So I think I say that to say that I think Terry was expecting to have to go hunting in the transfer portal for a lot of talent, a uh, significant amount of, of upgrades at certain spots. And I thought he did a fantastic job of doing so. I mean, I know there's a lot of money flowing into that program, and I'm sure they had to dole out quite a bit of it to land guys like Mark and Paluma and Kaluma uh, as and, and Jordan Pope and guys like that. But I think the pieces here are really great. I think the pieces here could fit together really nicely. I just am curious how long it's going to take for that to happen. Uh, but, you know, Jordan Pope's a guy who really, really phenomenal scorer, a bit of a smaller guard, but that we've seen that uh, that kind of player succeed at Texas. Frankly, we've seen that kind of player succeed under Rodney Terry, even before he was at Texas. Sule Boom was a fantastic player who played for Rodney Terry at UTEP before he got the job at Texas, before Boom uh, transferred to Xavier. And so small guards is something that Rodney Terry is, is has utilized successfully in the past. Jordan Pope fits that, that bill. And then you get just two veteran power conference guys. Tremont Mark's been around the block. Uh, Arthur Kaluma has been around the block. They've both been at two different power conference schools. They both are guys that have NBA aspirations are, are pr highly productive college basketball players. So you get these two guys in. Yeah. You got to figure out how the pieces fit together and there's going to be a learning curve, but with guys who have that level of experience, who've already transitioned to new programs successfully in the past, like I think that learning curve is, is diminished. Uh, and, and yeah, you, you don't have a ton of, High profile returners necessarily, but Caden Shedrick's, a, again, a veteran guy who's been in the system. Kendall Weaver was a really nice addition for them, a, an unheralded transfer uh, from UT Arlington, who, who was a nice kind of backup guard energy dude who I think is going to continue to bring that for them going forward. So, you know, looking at this roster, there's a lot of talent. There's some concern about how it all fits together, but I think it's a little bit mitigated by just the experience of the guys who are coming in and, and the experience of some of the guys returning to the point where I think I, I think you can feel a little bit more confident of like, hey, I don't think this team's going to be as disjointed and just like unprepared for the season just because of how much experience collectively this group has. Yeah, and like, for example, Andy, to kind of put some numbers to your point about how does it all fit together, last year... Uh, for Jordan Pope at Oregon State, 13.9 field goal attempts a game. Mm -hmm. Last year at Arkansas for Tremont Mark, 11.3 field goal attempts mm -hmm. per game. Like how, like as long as these guys can buy into one another mm -hmm. and help each other rather than like do things that undercut one another. Mm -hmm. if, if Coach Terry can get that, those two pieces to fit, man, it could be devastating to yeah. opponents but it could we've seen it go the other way andy um and and hopefully it won't but thankfully with mm -hmm. what kind of what you were mentioning about caden shedrick what i said earlier about arthur kaluma those mm -hmm. are guys that aren't going to demand and necessarily need all those shots and so i would imagine the vast majority of the offense is going to be those two guys and assuming trey johnson is able to transition to college well mm -hmm. him as well i think he's gonna uh, be a high volume kind of guy and so that'll be a really interesting. Andy, all that said, we kind of are alluding it to it in mm -hmm. the names we use. Um, this seems like a pretty obvious starting five to me, I yeah. think. I mean, there's some Kendall Weaver of it all. Mm -hmm. But did you ha have any any thought of inserting him into the starting five or was it pretty obvious to you? No, it was pretty obvious to me. And it's it's four newcomers in Caden Shedrick. Uh, obviously health uh, notwithstanding with Shedrick. But if Shedrick's your starting five, I have Kaluma starting at the four. Uh, we've seen him kind of play the three or the four, but I think for Terry's, just for the roster, the sake of the roster and the, and where they kind of have their, their talent, it makes sense to play Kaluma at the four. And then you play those three guards, Pope, Mark, Johnson, whatever – you know, specific position you want to give them. Pope's, you know, likely going to be the guy with the ball in his hands just because that's the role that he's played. But uh, I do think the question is, is you know, just dis dis uh, distributing the ball and, you know, sharing the load there because, I mean, it it's going to be tough for them to figure out who, who do we want to be the go-to guy, who's going to take the shots, to make sure that egos are all taken care of. But at the same time, opposing defenses, their third worst defender in the backcourt 
the worst defending guard for every team is going to have to guard one of these three guys. And that's a great, that's a huge weapon for Texas because all three of these guys, again, assuming Johnson transitions to, to college well, which there's not any indication that he won't really, uh, whoever's, whoever's the worst defender on the opposing team is going to have their hands full with one of those three guys. And I think that's a, an advantage for Texas. I think the concern for me about this team is not the starting five. I think this is one of the five best starting lineups in the SEC, but I don't think this is one of the five best teams in the SEC. We'll get to that. They're right around there. But my concern with this team is, is outside of that. How does this depth transition? Do they have enough talent outside of the starting lineup to maintain leads, to keep leads, to get back into games when one or more of their starters are on the bench? And, and we don't have the answer to that question yet, but it's, I think, something I, I would be pretty concerned about as a Texas fan right now. As well as, Andy, we were talking about it before we hit record, I'm not sure whom whom I most trust to be Caden Shedrick's primary backup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like if if Jamie freshman Jamie Vincent's ready to go, he he gets some real minutes probably um, mm-hmm. in that way. They I imagine they're probably going to have to play some small ball. Um, yeah. It's interesting matchups, you know, basically two through four with Mark Johnson and Kaluma. All mm-hmm. three of those guys are six 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 seven. Yeah. So you've got some size advantage at the two. Whoever is your two, it doesn't really right. matter but you've got a little size disadvantage at the four, but maybe you've got some athleticism advantage at the four. So it's just the matchups with this starting five are so interesting to me. But beyond that, I think you're spot on, Andy. There's going to have to be bench players that step up and step in and make a a crucial difference. Because again, we we often say in college basketball, you really need eight trusted dudes. So I think Weaver is one of those. And then you need two other guys to, to take those uh, um, bench minutes by the mm-hmm. horns and say, these are mine. And yeah. as soon as coach can figure that out, they'll be in good shape. I think Jason Kent's one of those guys. He was very productive last year at Indiana State, average eight boards, 13 and a half points a game. Uh, really, really efficient scorer. He's 6'8". He's skinny, though. I, I, he, he's listed as a guard in most places. So I don't really think he's your backup four. He's certainly not your backup five. So I think you have like seven ish, but then yeah, who's that next guy? Is it, is it Anyema? Is it Malik Presley who was not super productive at, at Vanderbilt last year? And Yema wasn't super productive at Texas, but at least he's got a year of familiarity in the system. So one of those guys needs to step up, needs to be a, a consistent backup option for them. Again, maybe it is Vincent, maybe it's Nicholas Cody, the four-star power forward freshman coming in again. Uh, if this team needs to rely super heavily on freshmen ranked outside the top 75, that's a bit of a, you know, it's not an ideal situation for this team at that point. But but I think overall, this team has a lot of talent. I just am worried that the depth is not there enough for them to, to be a super player. And that's kind of what we want to talk about to close out the show. How is this team going to do in the SEC? How, how are they going to fare in the conference slate? How are they going to fare in the non-conference slate? Where might that result in them ending up in the big dance if they even make the NCAA tournament? We're going to talk about that and make some of our projections all coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you about FanDuel. Folks, going to live events, it's the best. Whether it's music, whether it's theater, whether it's a comedy show, and of course, Sports, college football's back, college basketball is literally one month away, and I'm looking forward to making a bunch of new memories this college sports season. And the best news is when you're getting tickets for this year, Game Time, they have a new feature called Game Time Picks, which makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste your time searching through thousands of tickets. Whether it's Game Time's ticketing coverage, the lowest price guarantee, or the panoramic views from your seat in the app, Game Time has you covered. We talked about this game already. Texas playing Ohio State on college basketball's opening day. The game is in Las Vegas. T-Mobile Arena, November 4th. Game Time right now. Two tickets in the lower bowl. Just $56 a piece. Part of their super deal. If you want to go see one of the best games on the first day of the season, take the guesswork out of buying those tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. That's two tickets for less than a hundred bucks. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Terms do apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, Isaac, closing out the show, continuing our conversation about Rodney Terry and the Texas Longhorns as they transition into the SEC for the upcoming college basketball season. I want to talk about their schedule? Uh, the non-conference slate, the conference slate, and then we'll close it out with some projections, how we think they're going to do this year, how many games they're going to win, and where they might get seated in March. 
We already talked a little bit about the buy game situation for this team. Seven of their eight buy games are teams outside of the the top 332. Is that what you said? 332 yep. Yep. teams. Yep. Uh, New Mexico State, the only buy game in that group that is ahead of that, even though they're still not projected to be all that good. Uh, the good news for Texas is they are playing uh, some team named UConn. At her, I, I don't think they're in the bottom 300. I, I think they're or the, the bottom 30 or so. I think they're a little bit higher than that uh, coming into the season. That's obviously going to be a massive matchup uh, at the Moody Center to bring Danny Hurley's team into town. I think it's December 8th. Uh, and then they have a road game, a true road game against NC State, who obviously had a tremendous run in the NCAA tournament last year. That's part of the SEC ACC challenge. So nice to see Texas go out and play on the road, although I'm not super confident that this NC State team is going to be yeah. uh, as good as they were in March of last year. I think they're more likely to be what they were the rest of the season last year, which was pretty pedestrian. Uh, and then, of course, we talked about the neutral site game against Ohio State to open up the season. Thank uh, you. Very, very interested to see how that game goes. Uh, I think that's the kind of matchup where Ohio State's got a very new roster as well. New coach coming in, Jake Diebler, not not new to the program, but new as a head coach. So I'm curious how that game's going to go. Uh, and then they'll play Syracuse and then either St. Joe's or Texas Tech uh, as part of the Legends Classic. So uh, I don't actually hate this non-conference schedule as much as we kind of bagged on the 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 re- projected rankings for some of those uh, buy games. I think the overall quality of the schedule is, is decent and should set them up to be in a, in a pretty good spot with some of those opportunities to, to kind of iron out some of the wrinkles, figure out who their backup center is going to be, whatever other stuff they need to, to figure out against some of those buy games. I think this is an, an okay non-conference schedule. Yeah. Andy, and that, what's going to be really interesting is to see where their non-conference strength of schedule lands yeah. as you get, UConn pulling them way up to one mm-hmm. side and those seven teams in the 300s projected again, of course, right. uh, pulling them way in the other direction. So, yeah, as you said, I mean, that that I love these conference. Uh, what do you call it? C- competitions? Like challenges. There Scheduling we go. Agreements, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's like you, every other year you have to play a true road game mm-hmm. against another high major opponent. Right. Um, and then you get this UConn game at home. That's great. And man, thank you for making to to both Coach Diebler and Terry for making mm-hmm. night one happy for us, along with you know, we've got mm-hmm. another big game or two. But that yeah. I mean, this is the second biggest game of the opening night. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that'll be good. Really funny if they end up playing Texas Tech in the second game of that Legends yeah. Classic, Andy. Yeah. But um, all in all, some good opponents there. Uh, we go to the conference slate, where again, as a reminder, the SEC is the final. Uh, of the major conferences still playing just 18 games, which frankly I like, Andy. It allows mm-hmm. for more of that non-conference freedom, which is a good thing. I mean, how hilarious that the schedulers gave them at Texas A&M to start their SEC yeah. competition. That's pretty funny. But um, what, what stood out to me, Andy, as I look at the conference schedule, is they have a tough start at a mm-hmm. and hosting Auburn, hosting Tennessee, yeah. those three games in a span of eight days. And then they have another span later in the schedule where they host Arkansas, they go to Vanderbilt, and then they host Bama in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And um, those little runs of games are going to be very difficult. But of the six, uh, of those, what, seven games, f- five of them are at home. Mm-hmm. So you get Auburn at home, Tennessee at home, Arkansas at home, Alabama at home. Kentucky at home, not to mention that you get Texas A&M at home later. So there's a lot of uh, schedule favor in terms of that. You also do have to go to Arkansas along with A&M. So those two are tough. But Mm -hmm. man, so many of the toughest games in the conference portion of the schedule are going to be uh, at the Moody Center. And that's a win. Yeah, I was just looking as you were saying that, or right before you were saying that, I was looking. I was like, yeah, I think their their road schedule is pretty favorable. A and M, the first game of the of the conference season, like you said, they got Oklahoma and Florida are not pushovers. I think Florida is going to be pretty good this year. I think they'll probably be favored in that game, but uh, yeah, Oklahoma is the game Texas should win even on the road. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and call that one a pushover, if I may. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, yeah. Ole Miss, uh, we'll see what that looks like. Obviously, there's going to be a little bit of added uh, emphasis on that game and the whole Chris Beard of it all. And then LSU, Vanderbilt, South Carolina, like 
we'll see if South Carolina can recapture the magic from last year, but that's th those being your next three road games, pretty solid. And then Arkansas, like we said, that's a tough one. Mississippi state is, is a potential uh, challenging game for them as well. Kind of at the end of the year, when you're a little tired, maybe you, you drop that one. I think Chris Jans is a good coach, but yeah, I think if you're Texas, you're happy with this being your road slate for the first season in conference play. I think you have to be, I mean, that's the, it, it could be a lot harder than that. Andy, the, you know, I mentioned that game where they host Kentucky Mm -hmm. They're closing five game stretch. Three mm -hmm. of the five are on the road, but I think it's a very favorable yeah. ending to this schedule, yeah. man. I mean, it's like, welcome to the SEC. Mm -hmm. Here's things a little bit easy for you. You're at South Carolina, at yeah. Arkansas. That's the toughest game mm -hmm. of this closing stretch. But then you host Georgia at mm -hmm. Mississippi State and you close with Oklahoma at home. Yeah. Texas should go four and one in that stretch at least, yeah. right? Like yeah. that. that's a helpful way to close your conference slate. And let's keep in mind, that's when people are, I know like, Last 10 isn't as big a thing anymore, mm -hmm. but come on, you, you can't help but be at least somewhat yeah. um, persuaded by that. Yeah. Well, let's, let's take a look at how we think this team's actually going to fare in the SEC. And we talked a little bit about, about this conference in general and just the, the amount of depth that is in this league. It feels like, you know, Alabama and Auburn are at the top and then there's a lot of variability in how, how teams are going to finish three through probably eight or nine realistically in this league. And, and Texas to me feels like they're kind of in that conversation. I don't think they're going to finish third. Uh, I put, if I was putting a range, I put five to eight as my range. And I, my overall number for them is like seventh. I think there's going to be, you know, we'll see Arkansas, Kentucky, Florida, those teams kind of all fit, you know, behind, behind that uh, Auburn and Alabama, Tennessee, obviously in that mix as well, a and like, I think they're kind of in that seven, eight range is my projection for them right now. And I, I think that if they finish seventh, I think that's a, a reasonable, I mean, they're seventh in the big 12 last year. So seventh in the SEC would kind of help emphasize our point that maybe the conferences are, are fairly similar, even though this is a completely different Texas roster this year. Yeah. Andy, I think that all makes sense to me. I've got Alabama, Auburn, a and and Tennessee as my top four in some mm -hmm. order. And then they are in that five to eight range. And I think it's mm -hmm. Texas along with Kentucky, Arkansas, hilariously enough, and Florida. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I actually have Texas finishing sixth. And I think yeah. some of it is that what we were just talking about with a little bit of the easier schedule, a little bit of the easier road slate. I think that just kind of favors them mm -hmm. finishing in the, the upper part of that little four-team quad that we're looking yeah. at there. Andy, what do you see for Texas's regular season record? Yeah, I got them at 21 and 10. Um, I didn't project every single game specifically, but I did uh, fin have them finishing 10 and 8 in the SEC and finishing 11 and 2 in the non-conference. Uh, the UConn game, even at home, is really, really tough. And then I think between Ohio State and Syracuse and NC State, they drop one more of those games. I wouldn't be shocked if they drop three in the non-conference, but I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, putting them at 11 and two, 10 and eight in the conference. That would put them at 21 and 10 overall, very similar to how they finished last year. What's funny is Andy, I gave them the exact same schedule, but with just slightly inner workings, I did mm -hmm. go ahead and slide them down to that third non-con loss. Mm -hmm. And then, but 11 and seven in the SEC, slightly ahead of you to give us the exact same regular season record. Andy, all that said, is Texas making the NCAA tournament? If so, what seed are you giving them and how far are they going to make it? Yeah, 21 win Texas team would be a stunning uh, team to be left out of the NCAA <laughs> tournament. So, yes, uh, they are going to make the tournament. Uh, I have them as a six seed. Uh, if they were to go 21 and 10, I, I think they'd be in that six, seven conversation again. They had a similar record last year and they were a seven seed. So, I project them as a six seed, but I have them as a round of 32 exit. Again, they likely be playing a three seed uh, unless you know Oakland goes ahead and knocks off Kentucky again or something like that but um, I have them again this is very similar to last year they lost uh, to a two seed Tennessee in the round of 32 didn't advance to the sweet 16 so I'm kind of projecting a, a very similar looking season which is kind of ironic considering most of this conversation has been about all the differences new conference new team new roster but yet we're still projecting at least I'm still projecting a, a fairly similar uh regular season and NCAA tournament uh, finish I'm in the very similar neighborhood I have them as a seven seed kind of a fringe mm -hmm. top 25 team yeah uh but I'm gonna have them upset whatever two mm -hmm. seed it is mm -hmm. make it to the sweet 16 but ultimately lose there in the second weekend you're not going to go, you're not going to predict the two seed. You're not going to say it's going to be Arizona for like the third year in a row losing early as Honestly, a two seed. <laughs> why not? Let's make that happen. Caleb Love against Texas. We're seeing it happen. Uh, there you go. All right, folks, that's our Texas show for you today. Hope uh, that all you Longhorn fans and all you Longhorn haters that are watching 
uh, with your horns down, have enjoyed getting getting things ready for the upcoming season in Texas. So for the horns lovers up, for everyone else, there's down, there you go. Uh, just straddling that fence, Andy. Uh, <laughs> folks, thanks so much for joining us. If you haven't subscribed to the show on video and audio, please make sure you go ahead and do that right now so that you don't miss a second of Locked On College Basketball. Four weeks, as Andy said, till the start of the season, and we're here getting you ready five days a week. If you haven't joined our Locked On College Basketball Discord channel, we'd love to have you there where we're talking college basketball all day, every day. Come be part of that. It's literally free to join. The link for that's in the show notes. Come hop on in. We'd love to chat with you there. As always, we want to say apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go Wildcats, and until tomorrow's show. Peace.